Okay, this is going to be part one of eight um, of an introduction to general federalism. Um, it's going to be uh, based on a document that was written by the same name, and uh, I've kind of divided it up into sections, and I'm just going to basically just read through that document and um, you know provide commentary as I go. Uh, the first section that we're going to cover. Um, is called why global rule of law. So, um, and the and the first subtitle for that is the background. So we're going to try to answer why would you want global rule of law? What's the what's the justification for that? So, in the world of global governance, advocacy, and theory, there are several different ideas about how this is evolving now and how it should evolve in the future. In explaining general federalism, we at least need to briefly place it in this context to give it some perspective. I'll start by trying to define the phrase rule of law, since it may not be clear what we mean by that. We take the orthodox definition. It is composed of five separate socially desirable goods or ends. One, a government bound by law. Two, equality before the law. Three, law and order. Four, predictable and efficient rulings, and five, human rights. First, the closest description of general federalism I've heard amongst academic groupies is that it falls in the cosmopolitan pluralist constitutionalism school. We do not believe that incrementalism, the idea that global governance should emerge slowly as a natural evolution from what is called administrative law or multilateralism, is prudent, safe, or a service to humanity. In fact, we are very confident that it will be, it will be disastrous uh, unless it is rescued at some point by genuine rule of law. We'll explain why and what follows. But we also don't want to. Uh, we also don't believe we can ratify a global constitution overnight and solve all the world's problems. We have concluded that there is a way to unify disparate political entities with an offer they can't refuse, and one that by design operates effectively and efficiently in pluralistic legal environments. And this means that we are so-called large C advocates, meaning we, yeah, meaning we believe in seemingly, so large C means you believe in uh, a constitutional framework for global rule of law, um, a formal constitutional framework with all the institutions that come with it and so on. Uh, small C is that you believe that you can do it without that. Um, so this means also uh, that we believe in seemingly two incompatible things at once. As in the case of the large C crowd, we also believe in a formal legal structure codified by a constitution, but a constitution of sufficiently clever construction that it can accommodate pluralistic legal environments effectively and efficiently and still remain the central sovereign power. And this is why we're excited about general federalism, since no one has ever come close to doing this before. So since we do advocate rule of law, which if, if not codified, it is not rule of law, it might be useful to look more closely at the merits of what is, after all, just a piece of paper. But we should first point out, any global governance proposal that does not advance as its platform the ratification of a publicly known constitution for a truly sovereign entity is, by definition, proposing something devoid of rule of law. This leads us to our next point. Our contention is, and always has been, that what is written on paper will last about as long as the heady days of revolution. Maybe a couple of years, ten if you're lucky. After that, all bets are off. The great American experiment pretty much ended when John Adams left office. That's why when you write a constitution, it's the institutions put in place in that early time frame. Their design, mode of function, mechanics for engaging the uncertainty of human affairs, much more about that later, that makes a constitution work. The vast majority don't do this. So the empirical data on failing pieces of paper is not surprising. In light of their own experience with an unusually static constitution, American legal scholars have naturally focused more upon constitutional adjudication than constitutional drafting. But an understanding of global constitutionalism and why we might place more value than others on mere paper demands attention not only to the way in which constitutions are interpreted, but also to the manner in which their formal content evolves over time. The mere paper objection might be better stated as an objection that formal constitutions are not worth studying because what is on paper does not necessarily translate into practice. Our findings suggest that skepticism about the effectiveness of uh, parchment barriers 
is more than justified. Sometimes constitutions neither constrain nor even describe the actual operation of the state. But that is all the more reason to study them. Because when you do, you are compelled to conclude that either all of them were written by six-year-old children or they were deliberately meaningless. To recognize that some constitutions are shams merely begs a host of further questions, none of which can be tackled without a systematic understanding of what the world's constitutions actually say. It is one thing to observe that formal or large C constitutions can diverge from actual or small C constitutional practice. It is another thing to know when and in what, way, uh, what ways they diverge. Our better political acumen tells us that most of these constitutions were deliberate shams. The political willpower and intent to create the institutions thus codified must be present and it must act quickly. This is another reason why we oppose incrementalism. Historical experience clearly shows that what is written on paper, or agreed to in treaty, is quickly suborned by the lust for power. Thus we make the following projection. If multilateralism wins out and the slow crawl to rule of law proceeds, it will either never make it or be overtaken by tyrannical powers. And the latter may have already matured. In any case, we have over a thousand years of blatant consistency to sleep well upon our projection. Thus, general federalists see this as a call for both codified rule of law in a written constitution, followed rapidly by the creation of its institutions. Its institutions cannot be created incrementally. If constructed as a system tolerant of pluralistic codicils, the scheme can work. And we'll explain later what we mean by, by codicils. If we track substantive law found in the average constitution, we can observe some interesting trends in constitutionalism. In 1946, the average constitution contained only 19 of the 56 substantive rights in the index given in the appendix. The appendix of this, this work here is what it's referring to. By 2006, that fraction had increased to 33 out of 56, an increase of more than 70%. This phenomenon of rights creep at the level of domestic constitutional law parallels the striking growth in the volume and scope of international human rights instruments over the same time period which warrants suspicion that the two developments may, developments may be interrelated, if not symbiotic. Yet the average national constitution lasts only 19 years and has a 38% likelihood of being amended in any given year. Over the last decade of the 20th century alone, over half of the world's countries made major amendments to their constitutions. Indeed, of this group, 70% adopted entirely new constitutions. This indicates that constitutional substantive law is tending to converge to a consensus about what constitutes rights, while at the same time there appear to be more and more novel rights being claimed. In terms of where constitutions over the last 60 years have differed the most, two variables account for 90% of all the difference of every single constitution of the last 60 years. These two variables are, one, the variance in the comprehensiveness of the constitution, some are war and peace and some are like label on a can, um, and two, the variance in the ideological character of the constitutions varies from A to Z, like libertarian to status. Um, in addition, over time, we've seen constitutions become more ideologically polarized and to converge more. So in one camp, everyone converges closer together. And in the other, everyone converges closer together. But the two camps drift farther from each other. First, on the economic front, quote, democracies enjoy closer trade relations with one another. On average, a pair of democratic states engage in 15 to 20 percent more trade with one another than a mixed pair consisting of a democracy and an autocracy. And this pattern is only becoming more pronounced over time. Therefore, within the current debate of the means and methods of global constitutionalization, general federalism is a means by which both comprehensiveness and ideology are generalized and rendered specific wherever and to whatever degree a given nation wants it to be. We'll see how that works more and more in what follows. We shall see how this works later. Um, so global governance for both economic and technological reasons is inevitable. And we're getting into the reasons why we need global, global rule of law. Um, and one is that it's just inevitable. Um, there are two approaches. The default in play now, variously known as multilateralism, multilateralism and disaggregated states, which we don't think will work, or transparently, openly, transparent, openly ratified global rule of law. Which do you want? Secrecy and deception are becoming less and less viable as the information age heats up. 
So in other words, there is this status quo out there now um, that is referred to as multilateralism and also as disaggregated states. Um, we've done a video on that, uh, on the slaughter fallacy, but that's sort of the mainstream, um, more common camp. Um, other camps like general federalism um, uh, propose transparent, openly ratified global rule of law. So to be clear, multilateralism and disaggregated states are creating a vast power vacuum in the global arena, whether we like it or not. That vacuum is exceedingly dangerous and needs to be filled with something worthy of our consent. By now, it is no longer a question of whether one agrees with world government existing. It's a question of what world government you're going to allow to exist. Amongst those involved in the process, it is now common knowledge that a world government of disaggregated states, consisting of unaccountable, unelected, and unnamed, quote, agents exist. And the very nature of this cartel makes it hard to convince the public that such a thing already exists. As Anne-Marie Slaughter put it, these are judges, lawyers, politicians, civil servants, corporate executives, executives, uh, philanthropists, etc., all of whom none of us would know or recognize. The fight today is to substitute a legitimate form of governance for the disaster already put in place. A little bit of background on this. Um, so because of technological innovation, um, there's you know two things have happened. One is, is that um, there's been a greater intensity of interaction between people um, between countries. So a lot more sharing of culture and ideas and so on as a result of um, technological innovation. Um, and the flip side of that is that it has also allowed um, for the exercise of powers that couldn't otherwise be exercised. So it allowed for the exercise of powers internationally that could not have been exercised before. And that's where the power of vacuum came from, has come from. And the um, sort of the slaughter camp, if you will, uh, this multilateralism disaggregated states camp is presently filling um, that, that power gap or that, that power vacuum. And um, we did a video on that, but um, it's only natural that it would. Something had to fill that, that vacuum. And it's not fully filled, it's not fully crystallized, but it's uh, incrementally uh, crystallizing over time. So a uh, third reason why we should uh, uh, consider global rule of law, or why we need it. As a result of the aforementioned, domestic policies and nations around the world are already being affected and adjusted by the, quote, foreign agents with a global agenda. It's just that the public doesn't realize it yet precisely because of the secretive or low-key nature of the act. Uh, the irony of the situation couldn't be more stupendous. Those screaming against world government are too late, and their protestations only make it harder to remedy the present condition. As the saga continues, the problem only deepens, making the odds of victory longer and longer. This fact needs to be communicated, because observing the internet and YouTube, it's clear few if any realize this. It must be communicated that the idea of world government in and of itself is not inherently evil. It's how it's done, who's involved, and what its ultimate content is that matters. The status quo has a predictable and identifiable character that is filling the power vacuum of global, global rule of law that nature itself has created. Nature created this because of the inherent globalization of the world due to technological change, which I mentioned. We discuss the inevitability of global rule of law and we can identify its footprint rather easily. One of literally dozens of cases in point is the financial crisis in Iceland. Here the fingerprint of neoliberal western democracy called moral hazard created by systems purporting to operate in rule of law when they do not. We shall discuss and support this contention in a following section. But the mortgage crisis in the United States was an example of the suborning of rule of law. The global effect of this was that many countries, like Iceland, could make considerable capital gains both by investing their own money and borrowing money to invest, called leveraged investing. By not applying the rule of law to the U.S. mortgage fiasco, and the same thing was happening in other countries as well, and government officials ignoring the obviously fraudulent financial practices there, the United States government created a moral hazard in Iceland. Basically, one can suborn rule of law by creating moral hazards which insulate the forces of causation from accountability. A moral hazard can be created by any number of means, but in this case it was, the, it was suborning of rule of law itself that caused a moral hazard that begat another suborning of rule of law outside the jurisdiction of the United States, that is, international. Thus, it is clear that this stands as a very, very good reason for global rule of law 
when moral hazards can be created by an actor or actress in another jurisdiction, the consequences of which can bring down an entire nation's economy. And that is exactly what happened. By taking the bait of a moral hazard, Icelanders invested in these fraudulent schemes. And when it went belly up, as we will explain more fully in what follows, Icelanders were suddenly burdened with an astonishing debt, redounding to a sentence of virtual slavery to the international financial system. Only by holding a referendum and kicking out the Icelandic government that did nothing to stop this moral hazard were they able to regain control and simply refuse to pay these debts. We shall see in what follows that this international projection of moral hazards is not an exception but the rule, and it is a fingerprint of the neoliberal Western democracy. There's a very close connection between the, this school of thought about the, the neoliberal Western democracy school of thought and um, this world government movement I'm referring to of multilateralism and disaggregated states, and we'll see more of that. The International Monetary Fund and World Bank use predatory tactics to loan money to developing countries and, in a similar way as was done in Iceland, create moral hazards. Moral hazard and irresponsibility are two sides of the same coin. We shall quickly and easily see that failure to implement global rule of law is to further aid and abet moral hazard and is therefore grossly irresponsible when we consider the scale of the foible. Therefore, the failure to implement genuine global rule of law could be regarded by future observers as criminal omission. In other words, we shall show that the necessity of global rule of law is now clear and present. Another reason why we need global rule of law. The problems of standards and technology are vastly improved with the global rule of law. While it may seem to be a minor point, under a global regulation scheme, consumer and business services and products would be dramatically better and more standardized allowing much greater compatibility between products and services. All cell phones would use the same charger. All cars use the same charging stations or gas pumps. All household appliances run on the same power and have the same replacement components, etc. The effect of such standardization to the general public, however, would be more indirect in that businesses and industries would see significant efficiency gains due to standardization of expensive technologies resulting in savings passed on to the consumer. Another reason for a global rule of law is lack of political will to accomplish the most necessary and serious business, something that is becoming increasingly global and tragic. Suppose it was discovered that a celestial object would impact Earth in two years and annihilate it. The global political will to cooperate and evacuate as many human beings as quickly, thoroughly, and justly as possible would likely never happen without a competent global authority. In fact, they likely wouldn't even tell you about it. Suppose it were possible to feed the entire world's population with donations from a handful of billionaires who were more than willing to do so, but who could not because of jurisdictional and rule of law problems in the affected areas. This happens to occur a lot. Lack of common fiscal policy has resulted in a dramatic loss of manufacturing jobs in the United States and a dangerous and unhealthy pattern of reducing the capacity of the United States to manufacture critical goods. National borders exist as inheritors of an ancient paradigm of, <clears throat> paradigm of resource competition by force of arms in which cooperation was not always technologically feasible. Though this is no longer a limitation for cooperation, and even though the continued presence of these borders undermines cooperation today, we still maintain these borders unnecessarily. Lack of common fiscal policy has produced inefficiencies due to unnecessary factors such as sovereign, quote, import and export duties and currency exchange in the global trading network costing billions annually. While the waste aforementioned is measured in billions, the bizarre, unnecessary, and ludicrous redundancy in military hardware globally in order to establish support and maintain, quote, sovereignty and foreign policy wastes trillions of dollars, literally trillions. The impact this would have on the global economy if these vast resources were used responsibly would be phenomenal. Every single person on the globe lacking adequate housing and food could be provided for with those funds. The current state of affairs is therefore completely unnecessary. Untold numbers of deaths, injuries, and cases of emotional trauma due to permanent separation of consanguinity relatives occurs every year for no reason other than the fact that someone drew an abstract line across the ground and called it a national border. The ability to deal with emergencies in public health, such as the spread of AIDS across national borders, has been greatly undermined by a lack of a central tracking and remediation authority with the power to simply operate in multiple jurisdictions. Psychopaths and despots are drawn like magnets to nations 
having the least stable and established governments, where they can seize power and abuse and brutalize their populations for decades. As soon as this terror begins, the cowards hide behind the right of, quote, sovereignty, and demand that no one intervene. Because of the selfish interest principle, nations will routinely ignore or overlook this in order to serve their own interest. Unfortunately, this practice is rampant across the globe. Criminal enterprises heavily exploit varying laws across the globe and the tendency of nations to block cooperation between jurisdictions for, quote, sovereign and, quote, nationalistic reasons is rampant. As a result, investigating and prosecuting criminal behavior is unnecessarily extremely difficult when perpetrators cross borders. Stranger abduction and human trafficking, trafficking for sexual exploitation has, for example, benefited from this greatly. Global traders in the futures markets exploit the existence of multiple jurisdictions to employ and direct mercenaries and other agents overseas to create disasters, catastrophes, and other crimes uh, from other countries where they cannot be prosecuted. Because of the selfish interest principle of sovereign nations, the nations that harbor these criminals do so because their own intelligence services support the action for their own geopolitical reasons. Meanwhile, the traders make fantastic amounts of money because they are able uh, to make history before they bet on it. So this, the futures markets are basically a betting um, market where you bet on a future event occurring or not occurring. And if you can control those events and make them happen or make them not happen, you can stand to make a lot of money. So if you um, base yourself in the country that is going to favor what you're doing, you can also avoid prosecution for the crimes because their intelligence services will protect you. Um, it's very common. Another reason for global rule, of law, global rule of law is technological proliferation and sophistication. Technological progression has vastly outstripped our sophistication in the social contract and governments cannot keep up. General Federalists call this technological deregulation. If this isn't addressed soon, all equity in law and justice itself will be impossible to issue. And only a global scheme can fully address this. Something will take up momentarily. Related to the aforementioned is the presence of weapons of mass destruction, whose number and type is bound to increase as technology progresses, creating a hazardous global situation where no central authority is in control. Technological de uh, deregulation is a deep rabbit hole. For at some point in the depths of this hole, we begin to see an ominous pattern develop. Corporate interests gain greater and greater influence over rule of law. That is government. That is, by definition, a fascist tendency. We believe the current status quo approach of global government is being driven in this manner, to some degree or another. Um, not necessarily as a design, but de facto. In the status quo approach of multilateralism, witt wittingly or not, the actors are simply applying and serving the engine of capitalism without any regard for whether this kind of economic system would work well in a global setting. The annual sales volume of General Motors alone, around $65 billion in 1982, was greater than the gross national product of 130 developing nation, uh, nations at that time. In terms of the 100 world's largest economic units of 1980, GM rates 23rd. 39 of the 100 were multinational corporations. Operating in many countries with diverse currencies and subject to floating exchange rates, multinational corporate management can and does manipulate resources, accounting, revenue, and even government, as the recent ITT Chilean episode revealed, and for one purpose alone, to maximize short-term profit. In its present primitive state of development, the corporate, quote, state represents the most deadly and widespread exploitative, exploitative tool ever devised, not only to protect the wealth of the few, but to circumvent government control, which has proven too narrow a base for modern technology, uh, i.e. technological deregulation we mentioned. National legislators, such as U.S. Senator Gary Hart, uh, he was a Democrat from Colorado, have asked the obvious questions. Has concentrated economic power now extended its, extended its reach so far that no government can control it? And more to the point, does the scale of world trade necessitate giant conglomerates which their home governments uh, cannot, or the home government cannot afford to defy. The late Emanuel Keller, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, it's C-E-L-L-E-R, U.S. Congressional Representative, in consideration of ITT's extraordinary jumble, quote, of companies questioned whether the good Lord had given anybody the prowess and the expertise, the ingenuity to be able to control all these operations. 
and Senator Estes Kefauver, K-E-F-A-U-V-E-R, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly too, as far back as the 40s in introducing the keller kefauver Act to strengthen a controversial section of the Clayton Act, stated bluntly, the people are losing the power to direct their economic welfare. In his introduction to, quote, America, Inc., unquote, by Morton Mintz, Ralph Nader wrote of the sovereignty of the consumer as the ultimate countervailing force to concentration of corporate power. Irresponsibility towards public interest becomes institutionalized whenever the making of decisions is so estranged from any accountability for, for their discernible consequences. Very good point. The modern corporation is the engine of the world's largest production machine. If it is to be more than a mindless parochial juggernaut, the hands of diverse values and trusteeships for future generations must be exerted on the steering wheel. There should no longer be victims without representation. In any just legal system, a victim would have the right to decide with others the behavior of the perpetrator and his recompense. Nader claims that the corporate involvement pervades every interest of our society. Companies are deep in the dossier, credit, city, building, drug, medical, computer, intelligence, military, and education, health and military theater contracting. And with these engagements come the parochial value system and insulation of the corporate structure. A United Nations report uh, of August 12, 1973 stated that the question at issue is whether a set of institutions and devices can be worked out which will guide the multinational corporations exercise of power and introduce some form of accountability to the international community into their activities. The report while acknowledging that MNCs are depicted in some quarters as key instruments for maximizing world welfare, yet are seen in other quarters as dangerous agents of imperialism, inadvertently admits the UN's own impotence as a global authority able to control the MNCs by concluding that, unlike national companies, they were not subject to control and regulation by a single authority, which can aim at ensnaring a maximum degree of harmony between their operations and the public interest. We may conclude with Anthony Sampson that the sovereignty of the multinational corporation has emerged. In its independence of government, in its self-contained organization and trade, in its private diplomacy and communications, in its avoidance of taxes, and in the security of the company record. <clears throat> and economic equity is exactly what general federalism brings into the picture. And um, we, we deliberately included these references um, going back 20, you know, 20 plus years, um, 30 years. Um, to show that this stuff's been, they've been talking about this for a long time. This has been going on a long time. And that theme's going to come up again about how the same problems are being brought up again and, and no progress is being made. Um, in particular in the United States is the example we're going to look at, but it, it happens in, in many countries. Um, basically, the neoliberal Western democracies. So, so an, another reason why we, uh, why global, global rule of law would be good is court shopping by the elite. While not common knowledge, those with the money and influence typically hop jurisdictions around the world to obtain favorable court and governmental rulings, and subsequently, in many cases, evade justice in other jurisdictions. The victim is left without lawful remedy. I don't know if we mentioned this later, but there was a case of a guy, a man from Saudi Arabia married an American, or a woman from the United States. Um, they, uh, he was very wealthy, and they lived in Florida, and uh, had some kids, and didn't work out. He took the kids and left and went to Saudi Arabia and uh, was able to do that because of a lot of money and influence. He, he had a private plane and everything. And he hopped jurisdictions and took advantage of that. And as far as I know, the mother still has never seen her children. She was never able to do anything about that. So the courts of Saudi Arabia sided with the father. Um, so um, just one example. Another, um, another reason why global rule of law would be a good idea. Um, the world is shrinking rapidly, too fast for current modes of ideological thinking. Related um, to, let's see, 6, which is point six, um, talking about oh, um, technological change, Ch change in the technological infra infrastructure. Related to that, um, relationships between individuals are intensifying socially, legally, and economically, and a system of justice to resolve disputes is needed. Otherwise, justice is absent. Specific ideologies are quickly becoming overwhelmed by the sharing of culture, views, opinions, and other ideologies precisely because ideology is by definition a special case 
of propositional governance. General federalism is the first system of logic surrounding the social contract we know of that is truly general and not hobbled by this limitation. Ideological belief systems lack the generality sufficient to be applicable to all societies. But because it comes with strong opinion, much like nationalism, it tends to remain staid, blocking any ability to see, quote, through the lens of other ideological belief patterns. The United States, with its Roman Empire complex, is especially adversely affected by this. Most Americans exhibit a marked tendency, especially evident when placed in an international perspective, to only comprehend local ideology, uh, ideological belief patterns and seem to lack any conscious awareness that other systems even exist, much less the reasons for or reasoning behind their form and design. And all ideologies tend to nurture this state of mind, which is a conspicuously provincial one. General federalism and the system it propounds as a solution can help enlighten and break this pattern. Uh, let's see. And we'll, we'll do one more point and then we'll, we'll break for the next, for part two. Sovereign regimes tend to compete with each other for a share of finite pies of resources. This leads to inefficiency, but more importantly, to any hope of establishing a concept of economic equity, not to be confused with equality, in which parties involved in commerce may resolve disputes. This concept is called general equity and general federalism, but perhaps of greater applicability is the realization that in many cases, the lack of general equity means that millions may have good cause for dispute, but do not even realize it. General equity tends to uncover and expose these causes. So we'll break here and pick up uh, part two. We're still in the same section, um, reasons for global rule of law. And um, we will uh, you know, pick up then and we'll be right back uh, with part two, uh, which will be a completion of this section and let's see. And we will move probably into the next section as well in part two, which is why major new ideas are needed. So um, we'll be back shortly.